is it. We've made it to the end of South Summit and it is time for our closing keynote um, titled How to Live with Your Dead by Shadra Le Bouvier. Uh, before we bring her to the virtual stage, I want to go ahead and intro her. Uh, Shadra Le Bouvier is a curator, art historian, writer, and organizer. She's a Dallas native, ninth generation Texan, a descendant from a founding family of the state and a 12th generation Southerner. She is a curator of Basquiat's defacement, the untold story held at the Guggenheim Museum in 2019. And she's also the first black curator in the Guggenheim's 80 year history, as well as the first black woman, first person of Cuban descent to curate an exhibition at the museum and the first black author of the Guggenheim catalog and the youngest independent curator to mount an exhibition. As an organizer, she recently crowdsourced over $16,000 to give to activists across the country during the George Floyd protests. She's been outspoken about the racism she's experienced um, at the Guggenheim, which created space and inspired a generation of museum and gallery workers to begin speaking up about the toxicity within the art space. She's co-founder of Mothers Against Police Brutality, which has been influential in helping to pass body camera laws across the country. She's a graduate of Williams College and UCLA's School of Theater, Film and Television with an MFA in screenwriting. And so without further ado, I would love to welcome Shadra Le Bouvier to the virtual stage. Um, I'm really happy to be here. It's an honor. I was so excited when Sandishe asked me. So um, without further ado, I will get started with how to live with your dead. It's a provocative title, I know, but in this hour, it is the best one that fits. The South, especially New Orleans and the Gulf, has learned to live with its dead better than any other place in this country. They are, in fact, sometimes your literal neighbors. I pass by, I pass by a cemetery every, every other day when I go to the bakery. The veil between the living and the knot is quite thin. It is where the past is never the past. The North is what this country likes to think of itself as. The South is what it actually is. I believe that every Southerner knows this. We are this country's truth in a way that this country doesn't want to know, which is to say that America doesn't know itself. There is nothing new under the sun and nothing in the past is more mysterious than the behavior of the present, Alice Walker said. I don't want to start off talking about graves and cemeteries per se. It's such a common trope, but I do want to talk about them, but the unmarked ones, the ones that we're living under and don't realize that we are. Of course, there's the St. Louis cemeteries, but what about the graveyards of the Choctaw people or the Chapatulas people who are literally extinct? What about the people who died of brutality, exhaustion, of terror, of birthing the supposed new world, digging the ditches and roads in and out of a place where humans were never supposed to live? They are still here, of course. This deep south, the mouth and portal of the bowels of this country was built upon coffins, literally, and of course, figuratively. Our neighbors permeate, our non-living neighbors permeate every aspect of living for the living. This of course colors the imagination of people who are not from here and thus are seduced by it. Anyone seduced by the South has not learned to integrate the ghosts that they live with, where they are and where they are from. The ghosts that they claim to see in New Orleans and Galveston or Biloxi or Mobile may just as well be the ghosts that followed them down here. Ancestors want to tell their stories too. The rest of the country's relationship with the South 
is in a sense chaotic and deeply unstable, much like its relationship with itself. They haven't decided what they'd like to do with us. The South is a place where in which our fellow citizens disown us during the electoral cycle and natural disasters, but also rush down here to buy our land, gentrify neighborhoods after they've done the same to their own homes, to marry on plantations and other American concentration camps, to film in our rural areas, all in search of the authentic. In this lack of imagination, the South becomes a respite to an overcrowded, over-industrialized North, a place in which the belief about the lack of education, sophistication, and exposure are turned into wells. Only by Northerners and only when there is an extraction of replenishment for those disconnected and sterilized in search of a truth, or of the truth at least. Was it, what does it mean to come to a place that does not belong to you, looking for home? What does it mean to want to commune with the ghosts of the South while ignoring your own at home? I do not say this in the spirit of secession, though my native Texas thinks of itself as its own country with certainly disastrous results, as we saw a few weeks ago. So I certainly don't mean it in that way. But I do mean it in the way in which the South has been left to die and, to, and left to its gods many times before. I have often wondered what did the Black people think when the last federal troops left Louisiana on April 24th, 1877, thus ending Reconstruction. This state was the last to be released of the continued campaign of the war of Northern aggression as they teach it in Virginia. I wonder what those black women standing by the side of the road, watching the last of the men in blue uniforms on horseback, leaving Baton Rouge, New Orleans, Alexandria, et cetera, for the last time. I wonder what those women holding the hands of their children thought, knowing that the government, the country that they had built in bondage, was leaving them to the elements, I wonder. They called it the Compromise of 1877. I wonder what the Black South gave for it and what they still give for it. The situations in the South are often likened to that of quote unquote developing economies, which is not a real term. There have been civil civilizations and economic systems since at least 2000 BC in Louisiana, for instance. And poor people, those left for dead, have quite a sophisticated sense and understanding of money and the economy, especially how it is stacked against them. I surmise that I could arrive right now in the Delta and find a multitude of economic experts that rival how smart people think Milton Friedman was. I can find right now in Jackson, Mississippi, the blackest place in this country, any economic expert that can tell me how inflation aggravates poverty. They can tell me better than any of the econ majors that I went to school with up north, how economic policy has failed them. This is to say there's nothing developing about the economy of the South or any place on this planet, so much as there is the development of the imagination of geographic hegemonies and what they think the people living, loving, and dying in the global South deserve. But it is a misnomer and unreal thing this idea that the South is quote unquote developing, which persists and occupies enormous real estate in the Northern imagination. Anytime a place is being set up as developing, you rest assured that caring paternalistic forces are or have moved in to show those living in the alleged hell of the global South, just how to make up time in the rat race of capitalism. There have been lots of talk, for instance, of Hollywood money 
or Tribeca money or the money of other East Coast foundations flowing into New Orleans, they precisely call it the Hollywood of the South, and how it will help build the developing film industry in New Orleans, giving jobs and much needed tax dollar, dollars, read, do something about those antebellum era pitted roads and give rise to a burgeoning generation of storytellers and one of America's most culturally rich parts of the country, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A quote from Jock Ewing will do here. If I gave you power, you got nothing. As many have noted, these coastal dollars come in with coastal trustees, coastal decisions from the top down and coastal supervisors. The money is almost never given to Southern organizations with Southern people to disperse and make decisions as they need for the region that they live in. And yet the South is a stand-in for an authenticity that the North feels that it lacks. This may have something to do with Manhattan stand, being a stand-in for the whole Eastern seaboard and scrambles down South to connect with that something. Trekking to New Orleans from JFK or LAX or Boston Logan airports and paying for second line nuptials in a place where one has no collection, no connection to the land beyond liking it is as completely ridiculous as it sounds. To celebrate the sanctity of a union at a concentration camp, i.e. a plantation, is as completely stupid as it sounds, which as I understand, you wouldn't believe how often the Whitney plantation is bombarded with wedding requests. The question isn't so much why are these things offered, or why do these places exist? There are people to whom these traditions and sacred crowns spiritual, spiritually belong to. Rather, the question is, but why do you want it? All of this exposes a crux. The North can traffic here, teach Southerners things, but lessons cannot and do not flow in the same direction except that of sometimes a sweet home Alabama variety. Why is it that way? Of course, the North thinks of itself as being developed, but it is something more. This country does not truly want to know itself. If this country were to know itself and by extension the North, it may not be this country. I'll skip over the parts and when I, in which I wax on and on about the richness and depth of Southern storytelling because there is not enough time to say it all. Witticisms lubricate the wheels of life, white lies keep families together and mitigate the cruelty and sorrow and certainly purple prose colors the gray drudgery. They are people left to their God and their devices. Thus, story storytelling is the only real currency and Southerners instinctively know this. It's why the laws here lie and the food tells the truth. Instead, I'll show you an example because I think it encapsulates a lot. About two and a half years ago, I packed up many of my books and belongings to FedEx on Oak Lawn in Dallas and shipped them to 125th Street in Harlem where I lived and have always lived in New York to curate Basquiat's defacement, the untold story at the Guggenheim. My show sought to bring the life bring to life the story of a most extraordinary painting, Defacement, the death of Michael Stewart, and the equally extraordinary story of its making. It was created by Jean-Michel Basquiat on the wall of Keith Haring's studio, who hung it above his bed, above the bed that he died in. And in that, the story of Michael Jerome Stewart, a young art artist who was killed, who was beaten by 11 MTA, LEOs on September 15th, 1983, and died of his injuries two weeks later on September 28th. 
The work in my scholarship have since been since become recognized as foundational to the to the field of Basquiat, to the fields of Basquiat, Keith Haring, and the understanding of art in the 1980s. I was the first black curator, the first black woman, and the first curator of Cuban descent to curate an exhibition in the museum's 80 year history. I was also the first black curator of a Guggenheim catalog and at 33, the youngest independent curator to mount a show. The embarrassment of the embarrassment of first in the 21st century is the sort of backwardness that the North is more comfortable thinking about as happening in the South rather than in their own backyard. The Guggenheim was completely embarrassed as they should have been of their record and has sought at every turn to do whatever they can to gaslight the public about those facts. But this keynote isn't really about that so much as it is about the example of the limits of the North and living with their dead. The North is not even capable at this time of being stewards of its dead. No, I wouldn't say at a time when New York City and other Eastern cities make Juneteenth a holiday but Seneca Village, the black settlement that was destroyed to make room for Central Park is literally right there. It goes back to this idea that the, that the South and the Northern exchange is a one way street. Part of my trouble was that I, a Southerner, so deeply Southern that I could not be anything else, had dared to teach the North about itself. How dare I, a black girl from Texas, embarrass them on the world stage by not lying for them. But this is precisely why I, aside from training and research, was the most qualified to bring it to life. The story of the afterlife of Michael Stewart and the way that it changed New York history, New York City history forever, directly challenges the Northern narrative of what it tells itself about itself to the detriment of the South. It demanded someone not seduced by this, someone with an understanding of narrative ne necromancy and living with the dead. This is something in which the South excels. Northerners indulge in an extremely dangerous luxury James Baldwin wrote in 1960 who also once said that he did not know this country until he went to Mississippi. They seem to feel that because they fought on the right side during the Civil War and won, that they can ignore what is happening in Northern cities because what is happening in Little Rock or Birmingham is worse. Michael Stewart's murder was perhaps one of the most notorious cases of police brutality post the Civil Rights Movement probably in the country and certainly in New York City. It should have never taken 30 year, 36 years for the totality of this story, which is essential to New York history to emerge. But then again, that would, that would have to mean that New York would have accepted that the same things that happened in Little Rock or Birmingham also happened in Manhattan and Staten Island. It would also mean that the rest of the country belongs to the people that they left to the broken levees and power grids and their destruction surely means theirs inevitably. New York, Philadelphia, Boston, which we call the Birmingham of the North, Baltimore, are all former and current seats of the past iterations of the American empire. The cotton picked on the remote fields of Seguin, Texas, Money, Mississippi, and Edgar, Louisiana, et cetera, were shipped up north through the railroads, making magnates of the Rockefellers, the Vanderbilts, and such in the process. The wealth and stability of the north was often in many cases literally mined in the south. If the south is poor and undeveloped, it is because it has always benefited the north for it to be so. And if the South 
And if in the South there is a crisis of poverty in education and access, one cannot unknow the poverty of memory which grips the North. It is a compromise just like the one in 1877. And I can tell you Harlem paid for it, Black Bottom in Philadelphia paid for it, and Old West Baltimore paid for it dearly. So it was fitting that a daughter of the South would come up North to show them where their undead have lived right there alongside them the entire time. Where their undead was trying to tell them a story. And doing this work, a necromancy of sort emerges and I found guidance in Alice Walker's work, Looking for Zora. In the same way that Alice Walker called out to Zora's unmarked grave in a thicket of weeds in central Florida, I went looking for Michael Stewart, Basquiat, Keith Haring, a generation of men and artists who had been killed by, the, by AIDS, the plague before this one, which we have not completely reconciled in our historical memory. Michael's parents are of Kentucky stock. He too is a child of the South, as were the dreams that landed them in Brooklyn and the efforts to reclaim his story. Story. That elusive thing that we're all trying to capture, the only real currency that there is. The film industry's fascination with the South stories and with filming in New Orleans knows no bounds. Arguably the first blockbuster epic and certainly a Klan rally on cinema, 1915's Birth of a Nation, depicted the lost cause of the Confederacy, kickstarting Hollywood's role in political propaganda and sending into overdrive the 20th century's lynching era. From 1882 to 1968, there were, according to the NAACP, 4,743 lynching victims in the United States. Of these people, 73% of them were Black. Most of them occurred in the Deep South. Hollywood has directly blood on its hands and certainly its own share of the undead who were present. Like nearly everything else in this country, it is built on Southern extraction and coffins. And coffins are exceedingly unstable foundations, if I may recall. They may collapse at any time. Hollywood probably doesn't even know why it is fascinated with the South but I'm sure that the DNA of its beginnings have everything to do with it, and then some. From Birth of a Nation to Gone with the Wind, Roots, Dallas, True Detective, and Beasts of the Southern Wild, to name a few. It is important to note that none of these movies or shows, with the exception of the first, were in cinematic form directed by actual Southerners. True Detective's True Detective's creator is from Louisiana, so there is that at least. There are, of, co of course, other works, Daughters of the Dust comes to mind, but these figure so prominently in the, alongside Daughters of the Dust, these figures, these movies figure so prominently in the imagination that they have created or will a whole industry of copycats while also promoting the belief that Southern stories belong to, the, to those who wish to tell them. I do not agree with this. I believe that they belong to the people who have lived them, loved them, and died alongside their ghosts in a land that the country abandons at will. How does one learn to live with its dead? Well, you first begin with the reality that they are living right there alongside you in the problems, the narratives, the habits of your life, your day, the world that you live in. The past is never the past as it often hasn't even come to pass. 
I believe living with your dead means allowing them to rest, removing their coffins from under the weight of the houses, lives, oppressions, inequalities, myths, and narratives that we build upon them. Let them rest, literally give up our ghosts. And this is where the South excels and what it can teach the rest of the country. We have, for better or for worse, invited our dead to our tables, to our homes, to our sorrows, and to our lives. Surely we are built upon coffins as well, but here I believe that we go looking for our unmarked cemeteries more often than not. We seek the disinfecting properties of the truth and Florida water. Living with our dead is an understanding that when we join them, we are at the mercy of the living to not forget us. What we do here carries to the other side as well. And we may still have a story. We cannot create the new world that we so desperately and urgently need without the, the not living but we must not demand that their coffins be our foundation. They called this port city, New Orleans, a part of New France, a part of the new world when the French arrived. This has never been a new world, but in learning to live on coffinless foundations with our ancestors, our, our undead and what they have to say, we might just actually have one for the first time one day. Thank you. Uh, if we could just give a virtual applause because um, that was incredible. And I wanna say for those who asked uh, in the comments, we will have a transcript available. Uh, so we have a little time left. Uh, Shadra, if you'd like to rejoin for yes. a <laughs> All right. I apologize if my camera is streaky, this is not what I practiced with, so. <laughs> it's absolutely fine. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, if anyone has any questions, I'd love if you could drop them into the chat at this time, and um, I'm happy to read them and deliver them to Shadra. I did see some notes earlier from uh, Sarah Carminati. They said, Shadra, I used to work in museums and you're one of my heroes. You made so many of us feel seen and empowered to speak up or cut ties with institutions that forced us to be smaller. Um, Thank and, you, Sarah. That's really kind. Thank you. Yeah, Sarah says, she said she might have to leave before the Q&A, but uh, they want to say thank you. Okay. Um, do we have any questions or comments from anyone else? This is our, our last chance, our last few moments before we close out South Summit. 2021. Well, Sarah, I, I see your comment. Thank you so much. That means a great deal. And um, I'm still working with this subject. If anyone wants to ask me like about <laughs> the dead, it's completely fine. I know people are sometimes nervous about that, um, but it's one of my favorite subjects. So, um, and I'm still kind of working through my own thoughts about it. So, mm. Um, I do see a question from Fabiola. Hi, Fabiola. Fabiola says, what are some books, works, or pieces that inspired uh, this keynote? Um, well, I was certainly thinking about defacement. Um, I was thinking about Alice Walker's Looking for Zora. I love her essay. Um, I was also um, thinking about, I mean, what, what, like I was thinking of Daughters of the Dust. Um, I was thinking about Toni Morrison's, um, e even though it's not the same subject matter, I just like the way, excuse me, the bluntness of Cinderella's stepsisters. Um, I love, that's one of my favorite essays of hers. Um, uh, the Garden of Midnight, uh, uh, I'm thinking of Midnight of Good and Evil. Uh, I haven't read it in a long time, but I was like thinking about what I remembered, and sometimes I love going from that place of not ruining it and just kind of working from memory. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have another question. Let me find it again. This is from Camilo Smith. 
Could you talk a bit about how uh, this idea of developing the South applies to a city like Houston? Well, yeah, I was kind of using that more so facetiously. I think that the South is, you yeah. know, uh, incredibly developed. Um, I think, but it's sort of, you know, I think the North and other parts in the country are less, you know, um, less aware of that. Um, I don't think that the South, I think that the South, what it needs is the room and space to be Southern on an equal platform and not have other people tell its stories, which is why I said, what does it mean to want to make this place home? And I think you kind of, you do that when you want to tell stories for, for, for a, ple a place and region and people that have lived here for centuries. So um, I think that I should have maybe like put that in quotations. It's, it's in quotations on the text, but um, you know, I, I, I'm always confounded by sort of the North and sometimes the coast, their ignorance of, a, of an entire part of the country that is a part of their country. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, we have another question from, from Cameron Chapman. Cameron says, how do we think about death with Cancer Alley when it's a kind of slow death, one that people deny and, and put off for later? Well, I think that's where, I mean, you know, it's one reason why I said like the laws here lie um, because storytelling I think is so powerful that that also works in the reverse. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that, you know, we've got Cancer Alley literally right down the street. And I think the way that it works is, you know, one, just like acknowledging the technical parts about how, you know, regulation is sort of selectively enforced uh, in the bayous and in the Gulf. And, and I think anyone, you know, a lot of people know about that lack of regulation or lack of enforcement rather because oil and energy is actually pretty regulated. Um, but I think it, I think one way it comes down to is the storytelling, like telling that story, telling that truth, like tell, going to the people who live with cancer, uh, live in Cancer Alley, and they've, you know, they've got stories of, you know, three generations at this point of cancer survivors or entire families being wiped out by cancer. And I would hope that, um, we can see more of those stories, but I think it's a way in which you tell it that is really about centering their human dignity and their truth without making um, their, uh, the way in which they've been left to the elements, um, the feature. I think that there's a way to do that. And so, and I often think that Southerners tell the best Southern stories. So I would, I would love to see that. Mm. Uh, Reese Ewing says, what are some of the ways you think we can look to redress the imbalance in film to put more Southerners in control of stories that center the South? I think that, you know, one thing that I, I think about that a lot, you know, um, a lot. I, I would like, I wonder if, um, you know, if there can be sort of calls, right? Like for Southern filmmakers of all stripes of, you know, whatever, and, you know, and actually um, find the resources and space for, for Southern, um, storytellers, Southern writers, uh, Southern cinematographers, Southern directors, because I often, you know, think that, well, not think, but no, even when something's shot here or, you know, the decisions are made in LA. Mm -hmm. And so they're kind of importing. And so they'll hire Southerners for the, 
um, to be production assistants or first ADs, but the power really comes from the above line for the storytellers. And so I would like to see, and I hope that, you know, if there's, um, you know, I don't know what that, I don't want to say lobbying because it's such a dirty word, but what that can look like for organizations or people who are kind of, or who are hosting, um, who are hosting some of these workshops to say, well, we, we also need to see a, a direct effort to hire Southern storytellers, whether they're here, whether they're, you know, in the Southern diaspora sometimes as I call it, but just where, where are they and where can we hire them? And I think that that takes direct resources and a direct plan and you and you put out a red flag and say hey we're actually just looking for southern southern filmmakers we're just looking at them and i think that you kind of you would get a variety of of voices like for instance people outside of the south don't realize that the south has one of the largest vietnamese communities outside of Vietnam. So, um, and so I think that, you, you know, doing something like that would allow those voices to come forward and not get lost in the stack of, you know, these open calls that don't really target region in that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think we're going to make this our last question, uh, but if anyone has more questions, uh, Shadra can tell you after this how to how to reach out. Ashley Zander says Guggenheim seems to have been kind of a culmination of this North versus South extraction for you personally. What was, uh, was that the beginning of this story, uh, this beautifully articulated North versus South? <laughs> well, I think that there are a couple of uh, articulations, I think, um, but I wanted to stay on theme per se. And I think that, you know, inherent is in that are lots of, there's, there's race, there's gender, there's class, there's, there's all of those things. And I think that the North South binary, um, for better or for worse, is a shorthand to kind of encapsulate all of those things. Um, I think that, you know, it's still, you know, there's still um, a lot going on in the art world. And to, I think it was Sarah's point, I'm extremely proud of having inspired a generation of art workers to stand up. And I, it's something that I'm still finding the words for, but I, I consider that a part of the exhibition and a part of my work. Um, but I think that, so, so it's to say, it's kind of difficult to find the words as it's still happening or I'm still looking for it. But I think that the North, you know, the, the Guggenheim is such a flagship institution of, of the North and of New York City. And I think it was really difficult to have a young black woman from the South and them being completely ignorant of Southern societies, like what it means to be from a founding family of Texas, what it means to, um, you know, and in that, like the, the, the oral history that, you're trained in, you know, coming from the South, like that training of oral history that, especially if you are a black woman and you grew up with your grandmother and how to get that out of the story, you know, um, the eighties, the art history uh, has not really been committed to paper. So a lot of that art history is literally oral history, which art history is not really set up to deal with that. So you, and so I think it was really difficult for them to understand. And then once I was, you know, and using those Southern skills of storytelling and, and necromancy, narrative necromancy, as I say, I think it was really um, difficult to see, especially when you're in your sixties or seventies, all that you don't know and, you know, this 33 year old from a region of the country that you have tremendous contempt for is tell is showing you every day what you don't know. So I think that a lot, but not everything can really be understood in that context and that praxis, if that answers the question. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shadra. That was a that was an incredible speech. I'm leaving so inspired. Thank you for everyone who has um, stuck around and 
hung out with us these past two days. Uh, is there, Shadra, where can people find your work? find you so i'm working on my website um <laughs> it's uh so no website for now but i'm on twitter um at shadria at c-h-a-e-d-r-i-a -A. um and when and i'm also on instagram at lala bouvier um l-a-l-a-b-o-u b as in victor i-e-r and as I kind of unroll some of my work, as I consolidate and edit like essays, I'll definitely post the digital address online on Twitter. Yes, likewise, we'll do the same here. Thank oh, you. It's been so fun to have you. All right, well, I'm gonna go, but it was really nice and, and Zandashe, thank you again.